All right. My clock says eight o'clock. So um, welcome to uh, Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, Dr. Schnapp is um, out of town at a, a research conference, so can't be with us this morning. But it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our uh, Grand Round speaker, Dr. Megan Brennan, who is an assistant professor with us uh, in the Division of Infectious Disease. A bit about Megan's background. Um, she uh, completed her uh, medical degree at the University of Vermont, and then we were fortunate that um, she was attracted to uh, UW-Madison, where she completed her internal medicine residency, fellowships in infectious disease and women's health, a master's in epidemiology and training and dissemination and impl implementation research. The focus of a large uh, amount of uh, research and clinical work uh, uh, by Dr. Brennan is in the prevention and management of lower extremity disease in patients with diabetes. Uh, her research uh, has identified both social and medical determinants uh, of disease uh, in these patients that, as I'm sure she'll share, has a large impact uh, on their mortality. Uh, she's put uh, what she finds uh, into practice. She's founder of a, a multidisciplinary um, diabetic foot ulcer clinic at the VA. And her findings and her approaches to care um, have been incorporated into both national and international guidelines. And I'm really um, excited to hear uh, uh, what the latest is in this area from Megan. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. So thanks, Dr. Andes, and thanks so much for everyone joining me today. I'd like to start out with a quote from one of our qualitative study participants. This is, a, this is from a rural PCP within the UW Health System. Where do I send someone with a diabetic foot ulcer that's beyond my skill level? Maybe it's not an emergency, but they need a higher level of care. For one patient, I tried to do a general surgery consult, but they came back the next day and said, no, our wound care nurses don't see patients with diabetic foot ulcers, try podiatry. Well, there was an insurance issue with the first podiatrist, so we went through a second group. Time is going by. Now the patient is scheduled three months down the road. This is a guy who's on his fourth visit with me. He's got an area of necrosis and clearly not improving on oral antibiotics. I set up an MRI. My nurse calls the podiatrist's office to see if he can get in any sooner. Nope. I was thinking about getting vascular involved and it was just a bit of a runaround when the MRI came back positive for osteomyelitis. I ended up admitting him and he got amputated. It was a really sad outcome. I feel like if there was better coordination in the system, it could have been prevented. Today, I'd like to talk about diabetic foot ulcers and disparities in major or above ankle amputation. We'll be focusing on rural disparities in particular. By the time we're done, I'm hoping you will be able to define intersectionality. Second, you should be able to state which is more important in general to achieving an overall goal, collaboration across or within teams. Lastly, Everyone caring for patients with diabetic foot ulcers should be able to list four driving physiologic factors that are precursors to effective multidisciplinary care. So how are we gonna cover this? I'm going to start off by characterizing rural disparities in major amputations, including the magnitude of the problem and who is most affected. This is where I'll introduce the social science construct of intersectionality. Next, we're going to start exploring how health systems are contributing to these disparities. We'll look at urban successes, rural pitfalls, and what we can learn from engineering in terms of multi-team systems. And this is where we'll talk about the relative contributions of collaborations across versus within teams. Now we'll end with some good old fashioned physiology. I'll go through my approach to thinking about the physiology of diabetic foot ulcers and developing a well-rounded treatment plan. So let's begin. Over 35 million Americans have diabetes and 25% will de develop a diabetic foot ulcer at some point during their lifetime, 
And these folks are um, depicted in green. Just over 70% of those with a foot ulcer will die or undergo major amputation. And that's who's missing in this graphic. It was at this point when our team first started getting involved. We used a national cohort of 66,323 veterans with diabetic foot ulcers and followed them for a mean of 28 months. 20% died or underwent major amputation the first year. By two years, that proportion increased to 31%, and by five years, it topped to 71%. As I alluded to though, Americans share the burden of major amputations unequally. We went on to examine a national cohort of 56,440 Medicare beneficiaries with diabetic foot ulcers. And we found that the odds ratio for rural compared to urban patients undergoing major amputation was 1.35. The 95% confidence interval was 1.18 to 1.55 with a highly significant p-value. This estimate controlled for age, sex, race and ethnicity, and the general region of residence within the US. It also controlled for morbidities, ulcer severity, neighborhood disadvantage, and the frequency of primary care visits prior to ulcer diagnosis. 1.35, this is the rural disparity. But let's drill down further. Are there specific subsets of rural patients that face particular burdens? Well, our findings can be explained by a phenomenon called intersectionality. Intersectionality is a theoretical framework rooted in black feminist legal studies with a goal of improving social justice for multiply marginalized people. Women identifying as black really started understanding and describing this phenomenon, but it's not limited to black feminism. It can be used to understand disparities faced by any multiply marginalized group such as rural Americans identifying as black. An essential principle of intersectionality is that the effects of different interlocking disadvantages amplify in a matrix of oppression and neglect. And the resulting disparities are not the simple sum of each component. And that's exactly what we found on the preceding bar graph. Core tenets of intersectionality include overlapping identities oppressed or neglected populations and social determinants of health. Now we're gonna take a small sidestep here to ponder how unique, overlooked and marginalized rural Americans identifying as black have become in our society. This is Montero Lamar Hill, better known as Little Nas X. And he grew up in rural America, Lithia Springs, Georgia to be exact. And he identifies as black. In December of 2018, Little Nas X released a country rap song that went viral, Old Town Road. He originally recorded it during $20 Tuesdays at a small recording studio, and he did it in under an hour. For those of you who are unfamiliar, here's a snippet. Country rap, which is how Little Nas X described Old Town Road, crosses typical musical genres. And as such, it achieved a very rare feat being listed on three billboards, Hot 100, Hot Country Songs, and Hot R&B Hip Hop. It stayed listed as number one on Hot 100 for a record-breaking 19 weeks. So this song was incredibly popular. However, Billboard removed Old Town Road from its country charts just before it would have peaked at number one because, and I quote, it did not embrace enough elements of today's country music. That is intersectionality at work. I just made my first most important point and I wanted to bring us back to the outline and where we go from here. 
hopefully you'll remember what intersectionality is. At this point, I'd like to pivot from characterizing rural disparities to exploring ways in which we can reduce them. We are going to start with urban tertiary care successes, then explore rural care gaps before diving into some engineering principles regarding multi-team systems. The last piece should help you meet the second learning objective, stating which is more important, collaboration across or within teams. Now, in the past decade or so, there's been an explosion of multidisciplinary teams caring for patients with diabetic foot ulcers. These teams are almost always housed in urban tertiary care centers, and they can be found across the globe. Many sites published their single center experiences, and our team took on the task of performing a systematic review. 33 distinct articles and teams were included, and the first question that we asked was whether or not these teams improved outcomes, namely, did they prevent major amputation? Now, what you're looking at here is a forest plot of our results. The odds ratios and 95% confidence interval for each study are depicted as uh, points and then horizontal bars. Specifically, the odds ratios represent the likelihood of undergoing major above ankle amputation if you received multidisciplinary care versus standard care. So odds ratios less than one favor multidisciplinary care and appear to the left of the vertical line. All but two studies or 94% reported a reduction in major amputations. Because the teams were quite heterogeneous, we did not conduct a meta-analysis. However, the absolute percentage point change for major amputations following initiation of multidisciplinary care ranged from a 2% increase to a 51% decrease. So we asked ourselves, how did these teams do it? Well, I mentioned that the multidisciplinary teams were really heterogeneous. And so we needed a strong conceptual model and framework to start describing them. We settled on the Systems Engineering Initiative for Patient Safety or SEEPS model. The model states that the work system drives processes of multidisciplinary care, and this in turn influences outcomes, in our instance, major amputations. Within the work system, there are five buckets to consider, people, tasks, tools, organization, and environment. So let's start with people. The different types and combinations of clinicians was highly variable across teams. And as a researcher, it's quite frustrating because that's the main reason why we couldn't perform a meta-analysis. But as a clinician, it's honestly great news. It doesn't matter who you partner with. Working with anybody else appears to be better than working alone. Now, there were 36 different disciplines represented on 27 teams that reported their members. All but one team had both medical and surgical representation. Endocrinology was the most common medical specialty at 82%. Infectious disease was represented on 37% of the teams and 30% had a general medicine provider. Moving on to surgical disciplines, the four most common were vascular surgery, orthopedic surgery, podiatry, and plastics. With so many voices representing so many different disciplines, teams quickly realized that organization was key. Instead of having every clinician mixed in on every patient, the old plum pudding model, teams found it incredibly useful to have a nuclear group of two to three physicians spearheading the team with ancillary specialists called in as needed. So what did these teams do? Well, they worked on four key tasks that we'll finish out the lecture with, so I won't spend too much time on them here. At this point, you should know that the four tasks were glycemic control, local wound care, addressing vascular disease, and managing infection. Nearly 80% of teams addressed at least three of these. I also want to stress that multidisciplinary teams acknowledge that these four tasks could and often did happen in standard siloed practice. However, the multidisciplinary model enhanced the team's abilities to perform all tasks for all patients in a timely and consistent manner. <laughs> 
Within each discipline, providers did use very advanced therapies and tools, such as skin substitutes and endovascular surgery. But to facilitate teamwork, they chose very simple tools, sort of. The most common tool was a care algorithm, usually designed by and for the team with everybody's input prior to starting. Some were quite simple, while others, like the one shown here, were elaborate. It just depended on the wants and the needs of each group. Now we're gonna move on to the environment in which these teams functioned. All multidisciplinary teams mentioned in our systematic review were housed in urban tertiary care centers, but the really great ones were masters of their environment. They focused on how their teams would integrate into the broader healthcare setting. This is the point that's going to become very important as we apply urban lessons to rural disparities. Master teams met with specialists and primary care providers to map out referral pathways. Other specialists not involved in the multidisciplinary team knew how to redirect patients and providers to the multidisciplinary team. And rapid triage was emphasized. Especially in more resource poor settings, some teams spent time educating primary care providers how to care for basic foot ulcers so that the team, a highly limited resource, could focus only on advanced wounds. Clear parameters for referral in these settings was key, as was appropriate pre-consult workups. So let's take a moment to recap what we've learned from urban multidisciplinary teams before we explore what rural care looks like. First, multidisciplinary care works. It reduces major amputations. Second, the exact team membership probably doesn't matter too much. What you need are people able to address the four key tasks, no matter their academic lineage. Those four key tasks are glycemic control, local wound care, addressing vascular disease, and managing infection. Care algorithms built by the team and for the team are useful for getting those tasks done on every patient, every time. And lastly, the really good ones had a plan as to how they were going to interact with the healthcare system outside of their team. This included referral pathways and, pre and, and, sorry, and key pre-consult workups. Next, we're going to examine what care for rural patients with a diabetic foot ulcer looks like. And I bet you can probably guess that it's pretty different. To get a description of what's happening on the ground, we worked with the Rural Wisconsin Health Cooperative and the Wisconsin Research and Education Network. We used a qualitative approach interviewing 44 participants, rural PCPs, specialists, support staff, patients, really anybody that had a stake in this. And their responses led to the generation of this conceptual model. Now, the first thing to note is that there are rural and urban silos. On the rural side, we have primary care providers and podiatrists or wound care specialists, depending on the exact rural region. And these local specialists could manage wound care. And the rural PCP could theoretically address glycemic control and medical management of vascular disease. But in reality, they needed some sort of trigger to do this because so much of their time was spent rounding up a multidisciplinary team for more advanced care, especially vascular surgeons or infectious disease physicians who are almost entirely housed in tertiary care centers. Now on the other side of this were vascular surgeons and infectious disease physicians, and they struggled to triage patients with very limited data and lacked information regarding local management. So the bottleneck pretty clearly was the referral route between these two teams, or what I've come to call crossing the divide. Now, when I started out as a resident here, I never took an access center call. My patients just showed up. And I assumed that they had had some lovely trip from their rural critical care access up to access hospital up to F65. And then when we began reporting our results and describing this rural urban divide, I would invoke the image of a tightrope walk. But now since COVID hit, 
it feels more like we're asking our patients to vault across some incredible chasm to get here. To be clear, sticking that landing is difficult. Now let's take a closer look at what makes the rural urban divide so hard to cross. Well, first there's time consuming referrals. One PCP stated, a few years ago, the patient would walk out the door with a specialty appointment in hand, which I think is better. Now they have to call up some referral coordinator and then it gets computerized and somebody um, sends it over to the urban clinic and the specialty clinic ends up calling the patient if their insurance is good enough and all that stuff is approved. Urban specialists on the receiving end agree. By the time they come to us, they're already at quite an advanced stage. So if we wait for those referrals to happen, uh, it's just too many loopholes. Next is negative experiences calling urban specialists. And I need to preface this by saying that most interactions were positive, but all it took was one negative conversation to stop an outside provider from reaching out to the access center again. One rural PCP stated, I typically like to have all my ducks in a row before I call the specialist because I feel like family doctors are not really all that highly respected amongst the medical field. Another doctor said, sometimes we eat our young. Sometimes other doctors are awfully critical of what we're doing. Finally, there's the problem of multiple EHRs, which I do think is getting better, but it's not seamless yet. A rural wound care specialist said, we get patients from all over trying to gather all that information. Ugh, I'm surprised these nurses have any hair left on their heads. So it's no wonder that rural patients with diabetic foot ulcers see specialists at a lower rate than their urban counterparts. Now, this is new data coming out of a project that I'm working on with Dr. Lindsay Taylor and others. And it uses the same 100% national Medicare cohort that we examined when talking about intersectionality. In the left column, we describe specific patient subsets. First, we categorize patients based on their ulcer severity, early, osteomyelitis, or gangrene. And within those severities, we further divided patients into those who lived in urban or rural areas. And in the right column, we have the percent of patients who received specialty care, and we specifically looked at whether a patient had received specialty care from at least one of six specialists chosen based off of the most common disciplines represented in our systematic review. Now, the first thing to note is that probably appropriately, patients with ulcers complicated by osteomyelitis or gangrene were more likely to see a specialist compared to those with early stage ulcers, about 50% versus 20%. Now, we did strat stratify on rurality, and here's the difference that I want you to focus on. For those with osteomyelitis, a smaller proportion of rural patients saw a specialist, an absolute percentage point difference of 6.35. And among those with gangrene, the difference amounted to 3.85%. Now, the fact that these rural differences are more pronounced amongst patients with osteomyelitis and gangrene is particularly concerning for two reasons. First, these are the patients who are most at risk of major amputation. Second, this is also the patient subset where specialty care is likely to have its greatest impact on limb salvage. Now, if we look for evidence of intersectionality, we again find it. The proportion of patients who saw at least one specialist is plotted on the y-axis. On the x are different social identities. And for this analysis, we did not stratify on ulcer severity. 32% of the overall cohort saw a specialist, the first gray bar. The green bar again represents rural patients who were less likely to see a specialist, a 2.58 absolute percentage point deficit. And when we look to the far right, rural patients identifying as black again had a marked decrease, a 5.92 absolute percentage point deficit. 
Now, all this data is very new and we're still polishing our results, but I wanted to share it with you because I think it supports the statement that access to specialty care for rural patients and rural patients identifying as Black in particular is a problem. It is likely contributing to disparities in major amputations. So how did we solve it? Well, I promised you some engineering. At the top of this figure are two squares one representing the urban team and the other the rural. And together they constitute what engineers call a multi-team system. Now engineering research has shown in multiple scenarios, military, natural disaster responses, flight crew simulations, that coordination across teams predicts success than coordination within teams. And as healthcare providers, this resonates with us. It's the transfer paperwork, the discharge summary, the physician to physician call. These things have the most impact on our patient care. Now in the figure, this is represented by large bold arrows between the rural and the urban teams, and then leading down to the outcome. Those arrows represent a stronger influence on outcomes than either team's single contribution. So with this in mind, my team worked with the Rural Wisconsin Health Cooperative and the Vascular and Infectious Disease Specialists here at UW to create some tools that foster collaboration across the divide. We remembered those lessons learned from the urban multidisciplinary teams and started with a care algorithm depicted above, built by rural PCPs and for rural PCPs with input from UW specialists. And the algorithm serves as a trigger to manage glycemic control and vascular disease, while at the same time outlining appropriate workups prior to referral. It hits the four key tasks outlined in the black boxes at top. It also delineates the timing of specialty care. Simultaneously, we also worked with the cooperative to build a one-page referral checklist. It's designed to be used by a rural clinic scheduler so that he or she can find the key information in the rural health system chart and make sure that it's faxed to the urban specialty clinic with the initial request. Now we're hoping that this overcomes some of the EHR discordance and facilitates timely referrals that aren't stuck waiting for further information before scheduling. And we're now at the point when we can, where we can start piloting this at three rural clinics that refer into UW beginning this summer. So it's our first stab at addressing rural disparities in diabetic foot ulcers on a health system basis. Now I finished with my second main point, how health systems, especially specialty care access, may be contributing to rural disparities in major amputation. Perhaps you'll agree that coordination across rather than within teams is a stronger predictor of success. In our closing minutes, I wanted to review the four key physiologic factors that should be addressed when you're seeing a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer. We're still in the midst of building a better system for multidisciplinary care, but here are some things that you can start to use now. So these are the four key factors that were addressed by urban multidisciplinary teams. Taking hyperglycemia first, we know that elevated glucose leads to vascular disease and can precipitate mechanical complications such as Charcot. It also leads to an increased food source for bacteria and a decreased function in white blood cells. 7.5%, this is your A1C target. We know that people with A1Cs less than or equal to 7.5% are more likely to keep their feet. We set a target, but we also understand that this is not a threshold. And in fact, the original paper demonstrated a linear correlation between our reductions in A1Cs and limb salvage. So we know that any improvement comes with a reduction in the risk of major amputation. The goal is there to set a tangible target to shoot for. Now I know what you're all thinking. The people who show up with foot ulcers are not the people that have good control. They often seem recalcitrant and there's certainly a lot of complacency by the time that the foot ulcer develops. But patients with diabetic foot disease fear major lower extremity amputation more than death. This is your teachable moment. Patients are scared. 
and that makes them motivated to change if you simply draw the dots. It's our job to capitalize on this motivation. So let's move on to vascular disease. And I would say that this is the number one thing you don't wanna miss. These are the odds ratios for major amputation based on whether patients have vascular disease or secondary infection. Those without either serve as the reference. Those with infection but no vascular disease are not at increased risk with an odds ratio of 1.0 in the upper gray box. Those with vascular disease but no infection are at increased risk, 1.7 in the bottom left gray box. Those with both infection and vascular disease face a marked increase, 3.0 in the black box. So you can see that vascular disease is a huge catalyst for limb loss. And as such, it's important to diagnose it and address it. The problem is that peripheral vascular disease is vastly underdiagnosed, and the diagnosis is usually delayed until they see a specialist. 25%. This is the percent of patients presenting with gangrenous ulcers who carried a prior diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease. We miss this all the time, and it's not due to a lack of opportunity. In this national US study, patients were seen an average of 20 times a year before they presented with gangrene. In Europe, only half the patients presenting with an ulcer and ischemic breast pain had vascular testing before they saw a specialist. So what should you do? Well, I would order ABIs with toe pressures on anyone with a diabetic foot ulcer unless their pedal pulses are bounding. I would address smoking cessation. And I don't need to tell you that smoking cessation reduces the risk of death, but it also reduces the risk of limb loss. Remember that patients are very motivated at this point, and they may be willing to make an acquit attempt now more than later. You just have to seize the moment and connect the dots between their behaviors and the potential limb loss. Lastly, check their med lists. Every diabetic should be on a moderate intensity statin, and those with vascular disease should be on a high intensity statin. Statins reduce the risk of major amputation by about 20%. Aspirin's probably a good idea, and ACE inhibitors have been shown to lengthen the time between asymptomatic peripheral vascular disease and claudication. Now it's time to talk about mechanical complications. The first thing you want to do is grade the ulcer. Now I use the Wagner grading system, not because it's the best or the fanciest, but because it's the easiest and it gets the job done. Scores range from zero, no ulcer, through grades four or five, and those are wounds complicated by gangrene. Grading the ulcer will provide your colleagues with key information needed to effectively triage incoming consults and expedite wound debridement. Now, in addition to severity of the ulcer, there are two locations which necessitate urgent referral. First is the calcaneus, and that's an urgency because there's no surgical cure for this short of major amputation. The second one is the base of the fifth metatarsal. So your foot sits in a stirrup of tendons that help keep it aligned when you walk, and so that you step down on the bottom of your foot. Now, the peroneus brevis, or the lateral tendon, inserts at the base of the fifth metatarsal. If you have an ulcer that destroys this tendon site, what's going to happen is that your foot's going to start inverting and rolling, and you're gonna end up walking on this lateral aspect of your foot. Now, the picture on the right depicts this phenomenon where the wound starts at the lower base of the fifth MMT, and then the foot rotates in, and then you start developing breakdown along the length of the lateral surface. So that's why these wounds need immediate triage so that you prevent rolling in and further biomechanical complications. Now, finally, we get to infection. So I saved the best for last, but I also saved it for last because you cannot salvage a limb with antibiotics alone. You need to address all the other underlying reasons for ulceration. In terms of looking for osteomyelitis, my personal preference is serial plain films. These are highly cost-effective and easy to obtain. 
you need to wait about two weeks before the films, um, before between films, before you can expect a change. And this means that you have to think about getting your baseline early in the course. Now, if your clinical suspicion is high for osteo or deep space abscess and the plain film is negative, go ahead and order the MRI. I'll just remind you that T1 signal change is less sensitive but more specific than T2 signal change for underlying osteomyelitis. Now, if you find osteomyelitis, the standard therapy is six weeks, and classically we've used IV antibiotics for this. However, the OVIVA trial published in 2019 has really started to change this paradigm. Because minor amputations can offer a surgical cure without compromising too much infection, osteomyelitis and underlying di diabetic foot ulcers, especially sites involving the toes, are really good cases to try out this strategy. So in my practice, I've started to move towards orals in instances where if the oral fails, there's still a good surgical option. But in order to make these calls, you really need to collaborate with your surgeons. So we did it. Remember this framework of four different things. All of these have to come together in order for the wound to heal. Glycemic control, your A1C target is less than 7.5%. Vascular disease, order ABIs. Think about smoking cessation and statins. Mechanical complications, grade the ulcer and expedite referrals for those involving the calcaneus or the base of the fifth metatarsal. And in terms of infection, get a baseline plain film and remain vigilant. So thank you so much for listening. We have a long way to go towards closing rural disparities and disparities faced by rural Americans identifying as black in particular. I think one promising strategy is to focus on care coordination and collaboration across healthcare settings. While we're in the midst of trying to improve these connections, I hope I've given you a mental framework regarding how to approach caring for these patients in a way that sparks some interest for multidisciplinary care. These cases are common, but they're also complex. And as corny as it sounds, we need to work together to keep people on their feet. Now, there are so many people who have helped contribute to this presentation and the research underlying it. So I didn't wanna list everybody's names for fear of leaving somebody out. So instead, I've just listed the groups who've so graciously collaborated with me and Dr. Andes, I'll turn it over um, to you for a hopefully somewhat lively discussion. Thanks, Dr. Brennan, that's really eye-opening. Um, I'll, I'll wait for questions that arise in the, um, if you have questions, uh, again, put them into the Q&A instead of the chat if you can. Um, but I have, I have many questions. <laughs> so, um, so some infectious disease related. So I, I guess I'll start there. So, I mean, so what is it about seeing an infectious disease specialist that you think makes a difference? Is it when you're starting antibiotics, getting cultures before antibiotics, um, how long on the antibiotics? What is it that you think is making that difference in your studies? I think what's making the difference is it's always really hard to decide, is this something that we wanna medically manage or is this something that we wanna surgically manage? Or do we need to go in on this together? So basically the decision about a minor amputation or not. Um, and I think that we can help make those decisions um, based on saying, what's, you know, what's the biopsy show? What organisms are there? How aggressive are those particular organisms? And then also putting that in the context of the site. So I, you know, it's not just us alone. I think it's the combination of us with a surgical specialist, in particular, a surgical specialist that might be um, weighing the risks and the benefits of a minor amputation in those settings. Um, and then, like you said, also preemptively before the minor amputation happens, you know, having a discussion with the surgeon regarding what types of um, cultures are obtained, how they're labeled, so that we really have a great understanding um, after the surgery occurs, is there any residual left or not? 
Does that answer your question? It does. Um, thanks. So there's a question in the um, Q and A. I don't know if you can see these. Um, so the question is, how frequently is amputation a medical legal problem in which there's disagreement between the medical and surgical side, which limb is salvageable and which must be amputated? Well, I, uh, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure about um, specific stats regarding medical legal um, ramifications for major amputation in particular. Um, but I, I guess I would say like that's also a benefit of multidisciplinary care and collaborating so that you are trying to be on the same page. And then certainly those discrepancies have come up, especially with the, the exact um, distance up that we go if we do have to do a major amputation. And I think we've sort of fallen into a pattern that at first I found frustrating um, because I would think, well, why aren't we just going for a cure the first time? Um, but I think the kind of the pattern that we've fallen into is, well, let's try as minimal um, a strategy as we think might be able to do the job. Maybe that's just antibiotics. Maybe that's an amputation just at the toe level before we go to a transmetatarsal amputation. Um, maybe, you know, before we take it certainly all the way back. And just being really frank and open with the patient um, that, hey, this might not work. We might need to take it back further, but we're gonna try to save as much as your foot as possible. And I think that's also a really important point to work with the patient and be frank and honest. A lot of us have um, some hesitancy bringing up the fact that, hey, you might lose your foot, but I think that they need to hear it and hear it early um, so that it doesn't become a medical legal problem later. Another question here related um, a bit to what you're speaking about in the multi-team systems and uh, they want to know in your experience is it important to first build the collaborative structures that maximize team performance or to build the processes to facilitate and integrate team function yeah that's a great question um i don't know which is more important they're certainly um both critical I think when you think about a multi-team system, it makes sense to, within each team, have that structure um, set up beforehand and really focus on um, nuts and bolts within a certain team. But then after that happens, then I think the, um, the focus has to switch to kind of crossing that divide and how these two teams are gonna to work together. There has to be some thought put in beforehand, right? Because you need to have those connection points um, within each team figured out. Um, but I think largely you have to design each team, have a little bit of forethought regarding how those two teams are gonna connect and then work on the bridge between. So I have a question in regard to, um surgical referrals. So um, obviously, you know, if a patient has a vascular problem, they need a vascular surgeon or perhaps an interventional radiologist that does vascular care. But for management of amputations, um, especially given shortage of specialists uh, in, in rural areas, does it matter whether you refer to podiatry or general surgery or orthopedic surgery or vascular surgery? Do you have a preference? <laughs> um, I, I would work with the person who's interested in doing this, right? Like there are some vascular surgeons out there who love to do lower extremity work. There are some orthopedic surgeons who build a lifetime about foot um, surgery. And then there are some podiatrists who don't do surgery. And actually it was quite interesting because the systematic review was um, international. And so the, what a podiatrist does even in different countries um, can vary a lot. So I think it's, again, I want to move us from the idea of like, this person has to be in a certain academic lineage 
to what that actual individual does and what that actual individual is passionate about and good about. So whoever that person might be, that should be your contact, in my opinion. Great question um, regarding um, the collaborative academic rural work. And um, let's see, I'll frame this. So how do you deal with recurrent transitions with rural healthcare providers? The turnover is huge in PCPs and team members in rural clinics. Yeah, the turnover is huge. Um, and it's also really frustrating because um, so for instance, that rural PCP um, that I opened the quote with from her, um, she was fairly new to the UW system. And so this, these are not standard triage, right? Because you're not exactly sure who's supposed to be managing this. And when you have a lot of rural turnover, it's learning the institutional preference of how these patients need to navigate through the system. So I think having something fairly formal like a care algorithm and a referral pathway takes the onus out of folks coming in and turning over and not knowing exactly where in this particular situation those patients go to. Um, so that's why I think those two, two tools are critical. And then a, a barrier question um, as it relates to insurance companies and the use of multidisciplinary teams for patients being referred from rural areas. Yeah, so it is a huge problem. Um, it, competition within the insurance industry is not what I would call intense in rural areas. Um, and so they actually have less um, less choices to choose from. We also know that rural patients on average have a higher proportion of uh, uninsured um, status. So those are really critical. I think that there is certainly an option um, and a role for some more policy expansion here to try to um, bring more competition into rural markets in terms of um, insurance coverage, uh, and then also just making it economically viable for them to, to spread their wings into these, into these communities. So here's a, a two-part question. Um, the first um, asks what home protective methods exist between appointments. And then the second part of that question is, you know, what is the time frame? And I guess this is important in the patient education side that should exist. Is it days, weeks, months after first diagnosis and follow-up? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going to answer the second part first. So I think that they should be um, patients with foot ulcers should be sharp debrided really within a week. Um, and so that kind of necessitates very fast referral. That seems um, unattainable, <laughs> right? If you are a, a PCP. But if you start to build bridges um, with the podiatries, to, with the podiatrists that you work with, you'll actually find that a lot of podiatry groups have hidden saved spots for patients with diabetic foot ulcers that are new and incoming. And what you really need to do is reach out and call. Um, and it's kind of that one-on-one -on -one physician to physician phone call that gets the job done. And these spots exist in their schedules. You just have to take the extra step right now to, to call and make that happen. Um, in terms of home monitoring, this is a great question. So first, very interestingly, marriage is supportive. So marriage um, reduces your risk of limb loss. And that's probably because you have a spouse that can look at your foot. Um, and you have a spouse that can do the dressing change for your foot because a lot of these patients literally can't hip flex enough to see the bottoms of their feet and they have a lot of um, barriers to actually putting the dressing on themselves. So some sort of home um, other person there uh, is very, very useful in terms of just doing foot checks and wound care. 
Now, there are some really fancy stuff coming out. Um, actually, the American Diabetes Association just released um, one of their compendiums for foot ulcer care. And there are even these incredibly fancy things, um, which are you put in, into your insole, and there are temperature monitors for how you walk and step with the idea that the temperature goes up um, if there's area of uh, increased pressure. And you could try to capture that before um, it ulcerates with some modifications to offloading. So um, I think that we're actually gonna see a lot of really interesting technology start to emerge. Now that's a little bit down the line, but that's kind of where these, these home monitoring things are going, which is quite interesting. I also have a question on um, asking you to comment on vascular surgery participation in the multidisciplinary team. And, and I think I might add to, you know, something to that, given the time that it takes oftentimes to get patients in, what would you recommend to primary care providers as far as vascular studies that might be helpful to the vascular surgeon and available in rural settings um, if they can't get them in within that week? Yeah, sure. So they don't need to be going to vascular surgery per se within a week. I guess I just clarify there and say, you just need them to go to see somebody who can do sharp debridement within a week. So there are more podiatrists than there are vascular surgeons, but you will make your vascular surgeon very happy if you order ABIs. And then I kind of blew by this point, but if you're ordering ABIs in Epic, you can ask for something called toe pressures um, within the comment section. And it's the same thing. They'll try to do it on the hallux, the big toe, and they'll put a, basically a blood pressure cuff on the toe and kind of give you an indice for the toe as well as the ankle. And that kind of gives um, more data to the vascular surgeon as to whether or not there's a flow, enough flow getting down, not only to the ankle, but past the ankle, maybe out to where these um, ulcers really are lying on the, on the toes. The second thing that I would mention is that I think we get really frustrated when we order ABIs because we as at least from an internal medicine standpoint, I think we're told to focus on the actual number. And then we get frustrated because a lot of these folks have non-compressible vessels. But I would say, don't get frustrated. The next thing you need to do is look at the wave patterns for these. Um, and so that is actually still critical information um, for the vascular surgeons, whether they're monophasic, biphasic, or triphasic. Now, the problem is if you're out in a rural area and you're using care everywhere, right now, the part of the vascular testing that is getting transmitted from a rural clinic into the UW vascular is just the number. But the vascular surgeons also really want to see the waveforms. So that's why, especially one of the big reasons why we created the referral um, sheet because we need the full waveforms getting faxed over to the vascular surgeon when that referral happens. Um, so those are things that are gonna be um, critical uh, and helpful for your vascular surgeon. Also just you know, picking up on the medical management, right? Because they are primarily um, procedural driven. So they're gonna want your help um, and reinforcing smoking cessation, statins, all that good stuff. Another great, um question regarding um, early ulcer um, protection in at home and in the ambulatory patient um, where this gets bad before they can get someone in and examples boots insoles crutches yeah. Uh, yeah so that is great and they really should be leaving your office at a first appointment with some sort of offloading device so, um, and then we all need to be reinforcing actually wearing it, right? So we know that you need to offload the wound for at least 22 out of 24 hours a day. If they break that cycle and they do 23, it's like the whole, the whole rest of it didn't matter. Um, so when you're thinking about offloading, you can get um, a surgical shoe. You can offload the, it's a four foot surgical shoe. Um, and it's missing the front part of the shoe for if you have wounds over the toes or the metatarsals. You can do a rear foot offloading shoe, which is basically the, the posterior half cut out um, for calcaneal. Both of those shoes are really, really difficult to walk in, 
right? And these are generally people who have poor balance because they're neuropathic. So the, while those are easy to get, they're not my favorite. Um, so there's another device called a Pegasist. And a Pegasist is basically a flat bottom shoe. Um, it's a surgical shoe, so it's a lot more steady. And then within the insole, you can take the insole out and pop out these honeycombs to create a divot where the ulcer is, and you're a lot more um, targeted with your offloading, um, and the patient is less likely to fall. Things like crutches are great if you can use them. Things like roller boards are great if you can use them, especially for younger patients. My older patients also have a lot of fall trouble with them. Um, and then also the other thing you need to know is the turning radius on with those roller boards that you see the, the kids zipping around on down on campus when they twist their ankles, the turning radius is horrible. Um, you cannot maneuver that in anything that's remotely a confined space. Um, so just know the limitations of, of what you're doing. Anything else? I think that's it. So Dr. Brennan, thank you so much. This is really, really, eye-opening. Um, I don't think we all realized how big of an issue this is and the, and the problems that exist for our patients and, and referring providers. So um, thank you again, and thanks for your important work. Oh, thanks for listening. I, uh, I love working with everybody, so thanks. Have a great day. Bye.